Is capitalism fundamentally at odds with the climate? I'll ask Naomi Klein and Kashama Sawant in this Upfront special. In 2019, 11,000 scientists issued a chilling warning to the world. They predicted untold suffering due to the climate crisis unless global society undertook a major transformation. But almost two years on, and there's been little, if any, meaningful progress on transforming how we all live and interact with the environment. And climate change is getting worse. Global temperatures are rising, not falling. So is it finally time to launch a new and radical approach? Joining us to discuss this are Naomi Klein, Gloria Steinem Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University, and author of numerous books, her latest one being How to Change Everything, and Kashama Sawant, Seattle City Council member, economist, member of Socialist Alternative. Thank you both for joining me on Upfront. Naomi, I'm going to start with you. It's been seven years since the release of your book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate, where you argue for system change in order to save the planet. Now, in the midst of a global pandemic, we are seeing bailouts for, for big polluters. Billionaires saw their wealth balloon, while millions of people are struggling to make ends meet. In other words, profit has been put before people and the planet. Are we basically in the same place, fighting the same battle that we were back then? I wouldn't say that we are in the same place. Uh, you know, when I published This Changes Everything, as you said, in 2014, um, you know, the subtitle of that book was Capitalism Versus the Climate. And there was tremendous pushback, and not just from, uh, you know, a, a right-wing economist. It was from, frankly, the environmental movement, who would, you know, friends would take me aside and say, you know, you're, you're making things a lot harder for us by linking climate action to this transformation of our economy. You know, why do we have to link climate action with fighting racial injustice or fighting for gender equality? Um, you know, you're, I heard this so much, you're making it harder. So here we are seven years later, um, and the discourse of the climate justice movement ha is really being echoed at the highest levels of government. And I want to stress discourse, because there is a difference between what politicians say and what politicians do. But I think it is really significant that when you look at what the Biden administration is proposing, we are seeing a mobilization of resources, the likes of which I've never seen in my lifetime, with a stimulus bill uh, on the scale of around $3 trillion, with a great deal of it going to uh, so-called you know, green projects. Unfortunately, um, it's not just the discourse that has changed in those seven years. The planet has changed in those seven years. It's gotten a lot hotter. So what we need to do is a lot more. And so it may seem uh, hard to accept, but the $3 trillion isn't enough. We need um, basically three times that amount if we are going to address this crisis. But I wouldn't say that things are exactly as they were uh, seven years ago when I published that book. Uh, the planet's gotten hotter. Um, movements have gotten larger and have pushed centrist politicians like Joe Biden to do some things that would have been unimaginable just a couple of years ago. And, and, and Kashama, I mean, your work in many ways speaks to that. As a city council member in Seattle, you have been leading the charge and getting many progressive wins, whether we're talking about fighting for a $15 minimum wage, whether we're talking about uh, taxing the wealthy, whether we're talking about introducing a resolution in support of a, a global climate strike, things are happening. Can you talk a little bit about some of the tactics and strategies you've used to make that happen and how that could be instructive to people uh, who are in uh, the climate movement? I think uh, the emergence of mass movements, as we saw recently with the Black Lives Matter street protest, which brought 26 million people out on American streets, uh, in multiracial working class solidarity against racism, you know, movements like that, the fact that there have been climate strike actions, which youth have been leading, have really uh, brought pressure to bear on um, the big business dominated politics. And at the same time, uh, we see this chasm between the rhetoric that politicians are under pressure from movements forced to utter and the actions that they're willing to undertake. I mean, Seattle is a good example of the kind of tactics and strategy we need because. 
It is not a Republican stronghold in any way. We have eight progressive Democrats and one socialist, myself. And yet we have seen that the overwhelming number of victories that we have won, which is taking on big business and winning despite their opposition, like the $15 minimum wage, like the Amazon tax to fund an expansion of social housing and Green New Deal projects and renters' rights. Uh, you know, overwhelming numbers of these victories have been won uh, also, despite the opposition of the progressive Democrats, I mean, what we have done to win these victories is rather than me relying on trying to get agreement from uh, progressive Democrats or big business, uh, you know, lobbyists, what I've done instead, what we've done through our office is go outward and build movements. The $15 minimum wage, uh, for example, was won because we used our socialist council office to build the 15 now grassroots movement, which was independent of the Democratic Party establishment. And we launched you know, mass action conferences, street actions, street protests. And that is how we were able to win. Similar with the Amazon tax, that's the kind of pressure we will need in Congress as well. I mean, the battle you're talking about, particularly taxing these big businesses like Amazon, it didn't come without a consequence and a price. I mean, Amazon dumped big money into trying to defeat people like you. I mean, they put $1.5 million into local city council races to see you defeated. Of course, you won. Uh, help us understand how you're able to go up against such powerful entities and be victorious. Uh, you're absolutely right, Mark. I mean, they uh, really tried to do a corporate takeover in 2019, and millions of dollars were spent, unprecedented amounts. I mean, this is a city council race, and Amazon, as you mentioned, threw down a million-dollar money bomb in the last weeks of the race in October of 2019. And we were able to win despite that because, precisely because, and this is where, you know, the conventional wisdom of the Democratic Party completely be sort of betrays the interests of working people, is, you know, you're told not to rock the boat, as Naomi was mentioning earlier, don't mention capitalism in relation to the climate crisis. In fact, you have to do the exact opposite to mobilize people and to organize ordinary people into... Uh, tapping into their latent power. You know, individually, working people have no power. But if we can get organized into independent movements that are clear that the politicians uh, of the two parties are not on our side, that big business is not on our, on our side, that you cannot negotiate your way into a better society, you have to have a political fight back a political clash against big business. So this is this goes against the ordinary wisdom of you know not rocking the boat, and you have to do the exact opposite. Yeah, I, 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 just echoing what what Chama was just saying there. You know, when we talk about climate justice, um, which which is the governing principle of all of this, we often think about well, we need the, climate justice means that the communities that have gotten the worst deal under the current extractive economies, which are overwhelmingly black and brown communities, need to get green jobs, need to get green infrastructure in their communities, and that is part of climate justice. But it's half; it's only half of it. The other half is the people who did the most to create the crisis mm. have to help pay for it, have to pay more for it. We often don't talk enough about that side of it, but the truth is people are furious at the kind of corporate profiteering that has gone on during this pandemic. People are enraged when they hear that the billionaire class has increased their wealth during this time of so much pain and loss. And it's interesting that when you look at Biden's stimulus plan, that the biggest pushback from centrist Democrats is not coming from the price tag or the plans to invest in infrastructure. Where we're seeing the pushback is the idea that there should be marginal corporate tax increases to help pay for it. And this is really significant because, as Shama was saying, these are popular policies. This is the way you, um, you sell to the public that this is a just policy. Um, and so if it's just financed through deficit spending, my concern is that a few years down the road, this turns into an excuse for brutal economic austerity. Unless we increase corporate taxes, unless we say the polluters have to pay for this, then a few years down the road, this is, or, you know, or even just a couple years down the road, this is going to play out in the forms of massive cuts to health care, to education, uh, to so many policies um, that, that, that help working people. I have a question for both of you in line with exactly that. You know, you know, leading global climate economists are saying that climate change will exacerbate income inequality between rich and poor nations. 
How should some of the poorest nations in the earlier stages of development navigate the crisis? And should countries that have contributed most to climate change have to bear the burden of reducing their CO2 emissions in a more ambitious way? Thinking about what you just said, Naomi, about uh, it, it, it working on both ends, right? People who have done the most yeah. harm have to also have bear the most burden. How do we think through that? Naomi, I'll start with you and then, and then pivot to Kashama. Well, look, I, you know, that, that principle, right, of, of what is climate justice, it is that the people who are most impacted, who did the least to create the crisis, need to be first in line to benefit. Um, and the United States is the world's largest historical emitter. Um, the, that means the United States put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than any other country. It has been polluting on an industrial scale for several hundred years. And so what that means is that countries like the U.S. and the U.K. and other so-called advanced industrial countries need to pay into funds that will go to the global south so that countries can leapfrog over fossil fuels, go directly to green energy. Um, it, and all of this is enshrined in the U UN climate treaties that the U.S. has already signed. The U.N. Climate Convention says that countries have common but differentiated responsibility. So that means that every country has to be part of the solution, but there are differentiated responsibilities based on which countries have been able to develop precisely because they have extracted so much wealth from poorer countries, and that's how they got rich, right? Um, so the U.S. has been pledging to pay into these climate uh, UN climate funds for years and has reneged on its commitments. Um, so, yeah, we can't think about climate justice just within national context. There is no uh, nationalist response to the climate crisis. Absolutely. It has to be internationalist, just like the response to COVID needs to be. Well, you know, I think uh, Naomi made a very important point that there is no there is no solution to the climate catastrophe that is staring us in the face on a nationalist basis, on a nation state basis. This will have to be an international response. And that, I think, points towards a genuine working class solidarity, understanding, for example, that 100 corporations, you know, global corporations, are responsible for 70 percent of the emissions since 1988. So in other words, big corporations, conglomerates, billionaire class, they are responsible for this crisis, as, as Naomi was mentioning, and recognizing that these are global corporations. So in other words, the capitalist class in my home country, India, is every bit as um, extractive and exploitative as the capitalist class in the United States. And the working class in the US, across racial divisions, has an incentive to build united fight back here within our country. and to build international solidarity with working people outside the U.S. You know, because ultimately there is no hope of defeating and uh, really ad addressing climate change unless we recognize that this is a battle against capitalism itself. I mean, just to look at the statistic that The Guardian newspaper recently, just weeks ago, showed that the world's biggest 60 banks have provided nearly $4 trillion of financing for fossil fuel companies since the prime uh, Paris Accord in 2015. This is absolutely shocking. And so uh, we have to start with the question of taxing big business, but not just here, uh, you know, internationally. But I would also say, you know, we have to go beyond that and really advocate for what I would call a socialist Green New Deal, which in addition to these measures of taxing big business and expansion of green infrastructure, will also talk about bringing private utilities transportation, major fossil fuel companies, also key parts of logistics like Amazon into democratic public ownership of workers and immediately retool these corporations for renewable energy sources. And ultimately, we need a planned economy and we don't have much time to do it. So we cannot waste time hoping that someday the capitalist class will realize this is in the interest of humanity. They know it is in the interest yeah. of humanity, but they, they have no incentive. And I would just uh, it's also point out that, you know, the take, the doc, the brilliant documentary that um, Naomi Klein and uh, Avi Lewis had made in, in 2004, that, you know, that was an example of a, a workers taking into community ownership, democratic ownership, uh, a corporation, and how efficiently they did, they did, they ran it more efficiently. But I think that's a very key example, but we need that on a much larger scale. But, but that larger scale that you're talking about, requires a real radical vision. In fact, everything you've talked about, you've articulated a radical vision uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a real shift in how we would function both domestically and internationally. 
The challenge, uh, and I'll put this to you, Naomi, of these kinds of radical visions is that they're constantly compromised uh, by moneyed interests and corporate donors. Uh, we have the NGOization and the professionalization of the climate movement. Um, you've talked about this. You said that big green groups are worse than climate deniers in many ways. But how do we manage to not just develop, but enforce uh, a radical vision and a radical politics against the backdrop of all of this corporatization and professionalization? Well, you know, as, as I think we've been discussing, we build movements, right? Not, not NGOs. Um, mm. You know, which isn't to say that there aren't good NGOs out there that partner with movements. Uh, um, but, but, but you know, NGOs are not going to get us out of this. It's going to be movement power. It's going to be the kind of mass mobilizations. You know, Sharma was talking about India. Think about the the Indian farmers movement that rose up against uh, um, Prime Minister Modi's the agrarian uh, reforms. Uh, pand yeah, pand yeah. You know that he rushed through under cover of pandemic, um, which many farmers described as a death warrant, which will lead to more consolidation uh, of land in the hands of a few corporate uh, players. You know, s small farmers are a climate solution. Uh, res responsible agroecological farming methods sequester carbon, whereas these big corporate, uh, uh, you know, farming agricultural gi giants use huge fossil fuel inputs for their business models, right? And I think it was really striking that the youth climate movement rallied around the farmers and said, you know, th they're on the front lines of climate disruption. They are a climate solution. We are going to stand with them. Um, and faced, you know, enormous repression from the Modi government, including arresting uh, and imprisoning young climate activists. But there was international solidarity from the youth climate strikers. And it's like, that's the kind of thing we need to see um, from a grassroots climate movement. It can't just be young people who are doing this. It can't just be teenagers. It has to be everybody. Um, so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. These solutions, uh, these responses are radical in the best sense. You know, I always say that the future is radical. Um, so it's not a question of whether or not we like radical change or not. We are going to experience radical change, and we are already in the grips of it. The question is whether we are going to try to manage it, try to plan it, um, so that we have things like energy democracy. Kashama uh, was talking about um, worker ownership. We can have energy democracy. It, it, you know, as we transition from fossil fuels, we need to be bold in this moment. Uh, and in the face of all of that corporatization, Mark, that you're talking about, and just be fearless in proposing the solutions that will be radical in the best sense of actually getting at the roots of what is driving all of these crises. Because it isn't just the emissions in the atmosphere. It's the logics that put profits before people at every level. One of the real solutions that many in the climate movement have offered in their estimation is the Green New Deal. Uh, what's the first step to getting there, especially in a moment where we have a kind of centrist democratic presidency that for many is masquerading as a progressive one. You know, I'm not sure I agree with exactly how you've characterized it, because um, if you look at how Biden ran in the primaries versus how he is governing, it's not the same. He was, and, and listen, I'm not making excuses for him. I, I was a Bernie Sanders surrogate, um, you know, Biden was not my second choice, my third choice, my fourth <laughs> choice, you know? I mean, but I also think it's important to give movements credit where credit is due. Biden has already been pushed to somewhere he had no desire to go. But the very idea that he would be introducing a stimulus plan um, that is going to mobilize around $2 trillion for climate investments is not something that we should say, oh, well, he's just, you know, not interested in the Green New Deal. He's adopted the framing of the climate justice movement um, because, because the movement has been growing its power in the way that it has. Um, and he's introduced some policies that come directly from the movement. It's not enough. We need to keep pushing. But the fact that he has done this, I think, is evidence that that he can be pushed. Kishama, some estimate that the U.S. military is the world's largest consumer of oil and, as a result, uh, one of the world's top greenhouse gas emitters. Uh, many modern wars have largely been predicated on protecting access uh, to fossil fuel resources abroad. The U.S. military has 800 bases around the world, and it's no surprise that a lot of them surround oil uh, and natural gas reserves. Uh, what is the relationship between militarism and climate change, and do we need to essentially rethink or completely defund militarism in order to get to a just uh, moment of climate activism? I think, as you said correctly, Mark, that it is not a coincidence that so many, so much of the military apparatus internationally of the U.S. regime 
is uh, around the question of protecting the natural resources that these uh, corporations are extracting, not to mention that they are determined to extract every drop of oil from uh, under the earth if we let them. And so it shows how you know, you, it's not, it's not, yes, it is absolutely a question of building the kind of movements that we need to build. And, and the farmer protests are, as Naomi correctly mentioned, are a shining example of what is possible, you know, that there is, it is possible to build these kinds of fighting movements that go up against some really powerful entities. Uh, it, yes, it is a question of taking funds away from the military and towards productive and socially constructive and non-destructive causes. But in order to do that, it's not a, merely a matter of uh, you know building movements to pressure Congress to do it. And it is absolutely true that the kind of uh, infrastructure and stimulus uh, spending that we have seen, uh, and also the announcements that we have seen from the Biden administration, are almost unheard of. But we have to understand that fundamentally they're doing this because their own system is in such deep and long-lasting crisis. They understand that. And for the most part, it is an effort to shore up a, a really, you know, crumbling system. So, you know, it's not a surprise, again, that the International Monetary Fund, for example, which has been the institution that drove uh, just brutal neoliberal assault on country after country, including inside the United States, they are now advocating, maybe we need to tax big business. But it's not that they have suddenly turned, uh, you know, they, they suddenly realized that, oh, the, their system is bad for the people and for the climate and they need to do better. No, they're doing it because the, uh, uh, the system is in such crisis. The only way we could win something like a socialist Green New Deal, let alone the democratic public ownership of these big corporations that we need to uh, be that will be imperative is also in the United States, for example, the need to build independent political organizations because the Democratic Party is simply not going to be on our side for the same reason that the military is uh, spending so much money protecting fossil fuels internationally. We need yeah. a head on political clash with the political establishment. Naomi, a lot of people don't grasp how huge the climate crisis contributes to massive migration. Uh, just in the past six months, according to the International Red Cross, over 80 percent of global displacements have been caused by disasters, most of which were triggered by climate and weather extremes. Uh, is this issue prominent enough uh, within the debate, uh, given the numbers? I don't think it is prominent enough, um, especially because so many uh, um, people who, who are forced to migrate uh, from Central America coming to the United States, um, many of them have been linked uh, to climate change-fueled uh, disasters, very unnatural disasters. It's never one driver. I mean, this is what I think is important to understand. Um, the reasons why people choose to move are complex. It's rarely one factor. Um, and and climate change is a stress multiplier, right? So, it, you know, if you are wealthy, um, and you have various shock absorbers and cushions. Um, then, when, an, when when a hurricane hits your community, you you have home insurance. Um, maybe you have another home to go to. Uh, you know, when I wrote the shock doctrine, there was actually a private airline called HelpJet that was offering to turn people's vac uh, um, hurricanes disasters into a luxury vacation. And we sort of caught a glimpse of this. Remember when Ted Cruz uh, um, and his neighbors left Texas, which was in the grips of, of a crisis that many scientists have linked to climate change, and decided to check into the Ritz-Carlton in Cancun, right? So this is just to say that climate shocks don't impact the rich and the poor in the same way. If you are living um, very, very close to the edge, then a climate shock can be the last straw. So I think that that's really important to understand. And yeah, I think we need to talk about it more and more. Um, because there is such a discourse of deserving and undeserving uh, migrants and the, the idea of like, okay, if you're a political refugee, that's a deserving migrant. But if you're an economic or a, or, or a climate refugee, then that is, you know, that, that, then that's undeserving. I think we just need to get rid of this whole discourse entirely uh, because people have a right to move. They also have a right to stay. Um, so I think that this ties in with what we were talking about earlier in terms of what a country like the United States owes to the global South, um, you know, we need to be mobilizing hundreds of billions uh, in resources so that, so that um, you know, communities are able to recover 
from climate change fuel disasters. But if people have no choice but to move and, or choose to move, um, then, frankly, they need to be welcomed. Um, and it isn't out of noblesse oblige. It isn't out of, uh, y you know, some wonderful uh, beneficence that we're doing this. You know, the United States built the world that is forcing so much migration in so many ways. Thank you both for joining me. Naomi Klein, uh, Kashama Sawant, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having me. All right. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.